it's hello <laughs> the podcast the podcast where at least one of the hosts last night cried to the trailer of beauty and the beast <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if you can guess which one <laughs> one of them had insane diarrhea Oof. and one of them cried to beauty and the beast let's i'm not gonna give away which specifically which. Okay. okay okay great let's leave it there that okay that Beauty and the Today. Beast song, though, it'll get you. It'll oh get my gosh. one or the other of one us. One of us. <laughs> um, I don't even want so to see the movie. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> well, there's a gay there's a gay guy in it. So Uh-oh. Ooh, can't do it. Can't. Ban that from gay, my Christian theaters. <laughs> there's a gay guy in a movie about marrying a beast, so don't uh, worry about it. Get anyway, him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Today on the show, we have John Chong. Uh, drummer and producer from LA. It was a really good conversation. Yeah. Formerly of the band Run River North, who right. I in- incidentally played a show with in 2012, which is kind of weird. Right. Um, it was great. It but was let great. me let me take care of some business for Tidy a second it here. Up. Clean it up in here. Tid- pay some bills. Not really. Family that's meeting. People. That's what people on real podcasts say. We got to pay the bills. Um, no. So two things. One. Is that it's a I, it's officially been announced that I'm playing audio feed this year as lowercase noises obviously so for those of you who don't know that's in Chicago area um, and it is June 30th through July 2nd so I'm gonna be there um, potentially you might be there Josh is might that be true there. might yeah I would love to be there if I can okay um, potentially Stefan is gonna be there. Hell who yeah. was on last week? Um, Levi the poet's going to be there. Mm, passable. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm bringing Hotel Neon with me, so Andrew Tasselmeyer, who's been on the show before, will be there. Um, Dave Montel will be there. All these people from the show are going to be at this festival. In, Dang, it's like in a in Inkin Echo, uh, like like the who's Reunion. who of Inkin Echo. Yeah, <laughs> man. Um, and around that, I'm planning a tour, another living room show tour like i did last year and the reason i say that is because i'm looking for hosts um so people to be able to host the show in their home and there's a sign up form on my website so if you just go to lowercase noises.com slash tour you can sign up there's no commitment there you'll just be added to a list and i'll and i'll uh be in touch with you is it too sorry go ahead i was just gonna say if we end up routing the tour through the area i'll I'll be in touch I was going to um, say, have you decided yet what cities you're going to? Or do you have an idea tenat- of... Tentatively, I think what we want to do is kind of... Um, I mean, obviously head north from Albuquerque. So we'll hit Denver first and then and then start heading east, which, you know, St. Louis-ish, maybe Nebraska, don't really know yet. Um, and then back down probably through Tennessee af- after, the, after the festival. Right back on. down south and then back through Texas and or Oklahoma on the way home. So haven't figured out the routing yet, but wanting to get hosts, potential hosts, so we can help do the routing and uh, figure it out. It's going to be cool. It was really cool last time and it'll be cool this time again. And maybe you said this, will Hotel Neon, do they want to be in the living room shows with you? Yeah, they're going to be. Or as many as they can? Okay, right on. Yeah, they're going to be. And they're actually playing, they're playing audio feed too. They're Right, you did mention that, yeah. Yeah, so cool. which is cool. So, yeah, we'll be together for at least two weeks playing shows, and that's great. So, so email that boy. Lowercasenoises.com slash tour is a form you could fill out if you want, if you feel like it. And even if you're not in that area, you could sign up and be on the list in case we do another tour in a different part of the country. So, so there, that's my business. Right on. Tidied that up nice mm-hmm. and chip, chip, chop, chip with that. Chip, chop. <laughs> um, and say, while we're on the subject of business, if you would mm-hmm. like to support Ink and Echo, like the fine mm. people who already do, and thank you guys to our, our patrons who do support our show and help uh, literally pay the bills for Ink and Echo, uh, yes. go to inkandecho.com slash Patreon and... I, I'm sorry, guys. We've been actually kind of slow on the Patreon content lately, but in general, there's there's a bunch of stuff there. There's a private feed of exclusive yep. content that only Patreon listeners can can get access to. Um, 
and uh, you can join for as little as one dollar a month and that helps us out immensely yep so josh guess what's, what's happening right now it's happening. guess it's this is a first this is the first time i'm recording this podcast in my new studio yes excellent work <laughs> congratulations to me a round of ding applause <sighs> yeah it's actually kind of weird right now because i only have the bare minimum equipment i need so it feels very empty and it's a much bigger room than i used to have right. so it kind of feels like you know when you first move into a house and you don't have everything in yet it feels sort of awkward mm. um but feng you know shui. Mm, it's getting there though um Half yeah so way shui <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> that's terrible um yeah i'm learning about the acoustics in here it's really interesting to get used to a new room because I was so used to the other one, which had a carpeted floor and a slanted roof, which um, yes. both of those helped to deaden the room. And this room has laminate floor and a, a much higher ceiling. It's like 10 or 11 feet, which is more than a normal room, and non-slanted. So Got the non-slant going on, just straight, mm, just level. Old, totally. The old flat yes. ceiling. So I'm trying to figure out my acoustic treatment. I think I'm going to actually need more than I thought because there's just so much more wall space than I was anticipating. And I want to lock this sucker down, man. Like, listen, you could probably hear this. See, you hear that slight yeah. echo after my clap? Mm -hmm. I don't want that. That's the echo that. of ink and echo, yeah. That, that's, the, that's the echo part. part. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I can imagine. Uh, and you built a lot of panels <laughs> as it is. So does that mean you're going to build some more? Yes. Okay. Yep. Get out and the I old initially... hammer and nails and uh, put your put your oldest boy to work. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't know what else. <laughs> I do. I yeah, don't want my oldest boy uh, using a hammer or a saw or anything. Um, yeah, the live room is not done yet, but I can at least start moving into this room, and it feels great. Right on. So. You should uh, you should post some pictures on the Ink and Echo feeds just so people know what the hell oh, we're yeah. talking about and I'll do maybe that. Maybe even a maybe even a previous studio, current studio, so they know the I difference. Could, I could do that. I do have yeah. those pictures. It's pos possible to do that in this totes, world. Totes pos. Well, Andy, if you're done talking about that, I'm done. I've this week I did something uh out of character for for me and i went let me guess to the, let me guess you went to the post office and you didn't use stamps.com oh man <laughs> so. i should have used offer code nerdist uh or no, offer code bang bang yeah wow so many offer code wtf podcast jokes stop paying high ladies prices and for, for, for stamps anyway uh <laughs> no that was not it i went to the home page of soundcloud and okay so see the, here, the, just as a weird aside, I still don't understand why SoundCloud exists and why people would go to a browser to listen to things. But a lot of people use it because it embeds really well in other websites, okay. so they can upload a song there and embed it somewhere else. But gotcha. go ahead. Okay, that makes sense. Sure. Uh, so I went to the homepage, and there were I don't know ten or fourteen just the top tracks of SoundCloud right now. Were because, they all rappers? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. So I just I just went through one by one. And listen to these singles, many of which were by pe random people who I'd never heard of. And, you know, the album art is so strange and interesting. You know, some one was just like a guy's uh, image capture of a snap or of a, a FaceTime conversation. And he's smoking a blunt. And there's another <laughs> little guy up in the corner also smoking a blunt. And like, that's his album cover. Um, but just listening to these, there's a trend... And it's been around for a while, but modern rap, it just baffles my mind, the things that these guys do, because there's, there's sort of a formula it seems to follow. And this, this is because, I mean, I not grew up, but the rap I'm used to, or the hip hop is obviously Run the Jewels, but I listened to a lot of Eminem when I was younger, Jay-Z, um, gosh, mm -hmm. I don't know what else, but just like Pigeon the John, com just common kidding. names. <laughs> KJ52. <No. laughs> No <laughs> grits. Maybe I might have had a couple of those, unfortunately. <laughs> um, anyway, but this new stuff, I don't mean to sound like that old guy who is curmudgeon and like doesn't understand the, the young kids' music, but to a degree, I don't really understand. But that is what you're doing. 
I guess so. I guess I'm already <laughs> okay. there. Okay, so but this I, is hilarious. But I've been seeing this meme going around on Twitter about SoundCloud rappers, which is why I said that. And I'm yeah. trying to look it up now. And I guess the most the most popular meme says <laughs> it says when a SoundCloud rapper says, "quote You already know who it is." quote And then it's a picture of it's four pictures of this woman who's looking around like she's really confused, and all these like <laughs> mathematical equations around her face, like she's trying to understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love f- photographic memes being read aloud on podcasts. That's the best way to absorb memes. Is well, here I'll send it to you. You look at it too. <laughs> there. <laughs> Wait, where is now it? look at it and re- and respond on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that's pretty <laughs> enjoyable. Well, so anyway, I wanna I wanna take my take a shot at uh, at my version of of modern rap because i think i can do it oh I mean, hell it's yeah it's gotta be easy right i'm just kidding it's not easy but <laughs> okay here we go this is my idea of of how they go and andy's got a beat ready for me how, how do i know when you're done um i'll i'll tell you okay when great are right, you ready yeah dr Gaines, everybody it's the newest soundcloud rapper mm. here we go oh to my brothers on Western Hill. Oh, <laughs> that's a fun, that's a fun. Hey, 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 hold me up. Pass that on over here. Oh, here it here comes. comes. My girl, she getting some oranges. She making a uh, fruit salad. She making some moccasins on her feet and she wearing them paddles on paddles that's in her arm. Skirt. <laughs> Bra. Well, that money, well, that purple juice, Sprite, I mix it, Jim Crow, he bad, I fix it, flip it, off, oh, I got the wheels in the street and the, and the tires, history can tell you all kinds of lessons, but not my brother in my, <laughs> my boys, they watching some Arthur. He got what? he going <laughs> he going <laughs> Aardvark. <laughs> All right, keep it going. <laughs> and there's usually some like some auto tune on the voices, and they just stay down there all the time. Some of my homies they heavy, some skinny. Call the big boys, <laughs> Big John and Lil Eddie. Oh. <laughs> Little boat. That's my boy. <laughs> boy, little boat. Okay, that so that's that's about all I got. Um but the, the lyrics on these songs are just atrocious. Very interesting. Okay. Well it's almost I almost just picture somebody builds a beat ahead of time and then the, like a bunch of guys are hanging out in a room and they smoke a big old blunt and go into the studio and just say what comes to their mind. Um <laughs> I know Wait, have that's. You, uh, have you heard the story about how the "You Guessed It" song came about from OG Maco? No, you haven't heard this. Oh my gosh! I hope I can do it justice. So, if you're not familiar with uh, "You Guessed It" by OG Maco, it is. It is. Uh, oh, we talked about it on Andrew's episode because yeah, it was the tour it theme. On that. Yeah. Oh yeah, we did. Okay, but the apparently the short version of that story is OG Maco got drunk at Hooters. Um, came back to his house where his engineer was working on a beat. His engineer was passed out on the keyboard drunk. <laughs> and so he got mad and like slapped him in the head and woke him up. And then like went upstairs to play Xbox and then came back downstairs and just was all mad and told him to just play whatever was there. And that's how the song came about. <laughs> oh my gosh. And he created gold. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you're not necessarily wrong in your, uh, yeah. So, and I mean, no, honestly, no disrespect to any of these guys. I'm not sh- I'm not saying this is dumb or that uh, I think it's stupid or not true art, but it just you're just saying you're curious. an old man who doesn't understand, basically. And that <laughs> um, it's it's amazing that something that seems very uh, ramshackle and how it's been put together can get tens of millions of plays and that people really right. get into it it's just 
Fascinating. And that there are so many. There's so many little yeah. rappers who are 20 years old and they have some hit hit single hit on the internet, so to speak. And, I just wonder uh, what that actually yeah. does for them in right. terms of any sort of career, anything. I mean, maybe that's why yeah, that... you get any royalties or, or like ad kickback? Not from, from SoundCloud. Uh, no. Okay. Huh. That's why, that's another reason why it's a weird platform is because you can't monetize it, at least right now. Um, Dang. And maybe, maybe that's why people go there to listen because there's no ads or anything and it's free. Right. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's a different world we live in. The meme SoundCloud rapper world. Right. Fascinating. So well, good job. Thank you Thank for you. that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Little ear candy for our listeners. Well, I suppose it's time for a sponsor. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Okay, Josh. So t- today's sponsor is, I mean, interestingly enough, it goes with what you're just talking about with the rappers. Oh, and yeah. uh, th- this this new company has come up with the uh, SoundCloud Rapper Starter Kit. So <laughs> excellent. Uh, um, so w- basically, it's a it's a whole kit. All you do is uh, y- you get this little device, you plug it USB into your computer, and it has ev- it has everything you need to be a SoundCloud rapper. So it handles all the production. It'll oh. record your voice for you. It'll automatically upload it to SoundCloud. It'll create that artwork you were talking about. Oh, it'll yes. do it all. Um, and if you don't have a rapper name yet, it'll it'll generate that for you too. Um, so, yeah. What? <laughs> what? I, I I can't read my copy here. What what is what is this product called, Josh? That is called. The the <clears throat> uh, the rap kit one, rap kit SoundCloud one for SoundCloud edition. Oh, oh, rap kit one, SoundCloud summer. edition. <laughs> Getting on the essay with the single. I'm only twenty, but I got all kinds of listeners. Oh, oh, shorty got some jeans on, and she working that little peach booty. <laughs> yeah, so uh, rap kit one. Rap, rap kit one uh is is the all all inclusive all you could ever need to be a soundcloud rapper um that and, album the album cover generator technology is pretty cool what it does is it yeah. scans your phone and it just mm-hmm. oh. takes a random image from your picture roll might be just, a screenshot of a funny tweet it might be your kids you don't know yeah could be anything dick pic i mean whatever it is it just <laughs> just throws it up <laughs> throws it up there <laughs> yeah so it, it plays your plays your beat you throw on some headphones you lay down some raps and that's it you could you couldn't ask for anything better than Incredible. that i don't think and so i you know we mentioned this is rap kit one soundcloud edition they've also got spotify edition they've got youtube edition oh, for, the, for the youtube one you can just live stream straight from your phone gives you the beat and it's like an improv track you gotta just throw it down and one take and it goes up that's so great yeah well yeah so you guys can go to inkandecho.com slash rapkit1 is that is that o-n-e or the number one let's do the number one rapkit1 like because you'll be the number one rapper that's the tagline yeah be the number one for five minutes on soundcloud that's they'll shoot you to the top there to the top of the ranks Okay, great. <laughs> and now for our talk with uh, John Chong. Here we go. Well, John, uh, Andy and I don't know a lot about you, but one of yeah. our listeners was sure interested in or just encouraged us to have you on. So uh, what the hell do you do? And who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so, I am a musician, born and raised in Los Angeles, played drums for the last 10, 11 years in different bands, uh, the last band being Run River North, which I just left, mm-hmm. uh, I guess technically this year, and I am now a uh, analog tape machine producer. 
What oh, does that mean? Beds. It means Analog, that uh, it means that I'm going through a console. My medium recording format is tape machines. Gotcha. I do have Pro Tools, but I want to focus more on the tape machine aspect of things. Not because of the sound, <laughs> but because of the process. Just wait, yeah. why? Because it's more of an intentional thing? What, what about the process do you like better on tape? So, um, for me, yeah, it's the more intentional thing. Like when you record to tape, musicians are, they, they need to be on top of their game. I think when it came right. to using Pro Tools or any digital DAW, right. you, musicians tend to, I guess, rely on the editing, the post. Right. Pretty much they don't try to do it all up front. So the, the second album that the band recorded with, um, producer wise, we recorded with Lars Stauffers and we barely did any punch ins or whatever. So we, oh, we wow. really had to um, rely on our performance, like, right. you know, at the source. So, in terms of tone, performance, and all of that, like, I, I really believe that's how you get the best vibe. And, you know, there were a lot of like imperfect pitch moments and timing issues. But we kept him, and it actually yeah. added to the vibe of what we're going for. So when it comes to tape, there's a lot of limitations, not a lot of editing. Right. You can't really um, go back and splice things and, and move things around without splicing the entire tape or entire band rather than right. just the guitars. So you kind of have to commit. Also with tone, commit to the tone ahead of time rather than before gotcha so it's it's hmm. something that i kind of fell in love with and as a pro, as a aspiring producer i've i've done pro tool 7 you know like back in the day and i just never liked the process but once once i did the the tape machine thing that just kind of clicked for me so you're, so you're like a limitations guy you like the limitations dude that is my <laughs> entire i guess lifestyle minimalist yeah, where mm. even with even with drums, like I was gonna say, I watched the music video and you had like one tom and two cymbals. Yep. I think I noticed that. I was like, oh, that's sweet. That's cool. Yeah, that's my uh, go-to setup. I believe in minimal uh, in limitations. I feel like I am the most creative that way. Yeah. So, yeah, I try to get it. It started with cymbals. Like I was doing some jazz program out out here in in Los Angeles and trying different cymbals because cymbals you can't really adjust the tone you get what right. you get you can't right. tune it you can't unless you like crack break it, it or and, something you know break exactly <laughs> so I've I've wanted to get more than just one tone out of it with the ride cymbal you get like three plus more you know you got the the regular area you got the shoulder and you got the bell but mm -hmm. I I really wanted to get like at least five, six different tones from the ride cymbal. So that kind of made me want to limit myself to just one cymbal because, hey, I could get different sounds from this. Why do I need to right. um, spend time like setting up and packing up my drum set? Right. Yeah. So it's not a laziness, great. mostly. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I can see that, but that's also not laziness in a whole nother way too. That's really cool. Thanks. Um, so in transitioning out of, sorry, Andy, you go ahead with no, your question. No, well, I just wanted to, the, before we get too far in, I wanted to <laughs> put this connection together. So were you in the band in Run River North in December of 2012? I was in the band from the beginning. So yes. Okay. So do you remember playing a show with Future of Forestry? that month yes i think you've mentioned that and yeah. that was a very <laughs> odd show in glendora yeah. yes um, it was at this massive church and i remember you guys i think you either were forced to play acoustic or you chose to play acoustic was that what it was no we um i remember playing my full drum kit that night but wasn't think, everyone else playing like acoustic guitars and stuff or maybe i'm got that wrong yeah i think you're right i think we were limited in some things 
But we were also, we also got scolded at for not selling enough tickets back then, but uh, <laughs> by, by the lead singer of Future of Forestry. He came right, up to man. us during our sound check. Anyways. Andy, you'll have to give him <laughs> shit for that. <laughs> I'll text him right now. Yeah. It's just funny because the thing I remember about it, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on it because we, you guys opened for us and I just remember being like, damn, these guys are have way more energy than any other opening band we've had and they kind of like we kind of got a little worried <laughs> it's like well they're kind of stealing the show a little bit but it's like you guys were awesome it was so good but i'm curious Thanks. what your perspective was on that particular show only because that's like my reference for you and the band and that was before you were called run river north right you were monsters calling yep. home at that point yep yeah, yeah we had to change our name um oh you had to anyways yeah, that's an that's an oh we didn't have to, but we I think we they were scolded to. for their name by Eric in Future of Forestry. <laughs> <laughs> Eric said you didn't the, sell enough tickets and your name is really <laughs> dumb. So uh, no, we changed our name because a lot of people were asking, "Hey, where are they from? Los Angeles? Oh, they're gonna change their name, right?" And we're like, "Why? Because like the people that we wanted to work with, they already had of Monsters and Men on their roster." Uh, oh, dang. So we had to change. It's too many but monsters on this roster. Y- exactly. <laughs> that is the exact quote. How silly that they've oh my used. Gosh. Yeah. You're amazing. Um, so that <laughs> show, I think, other than the the scolding, I think we wanted to be there because I think some of us were big fans of Future of Forestry, right. and it was like a cool time to check it out. Yeah, let's let's play a show and watch the band at the same time. Right. But we, in terms of like what we experienced that night as an opening band versus other support nights. Like there's uh-huh. no difference. We, right. we always get, because we're, we were, or they were a band of six Asians. Um, it's, we always felt like we had to fight an uphill or climb an uphill battle to hmm. try to impress people. Like sound guys would always come up to us and say, Oh, why do you need to set up your drums on the side? Uh, we really? can't do that. Uh, oh. Why do you have to have six vocal microphones? Nope. Yeah, it's, it sounds ridiculous to have six vocal mm. mics on stage, but we all do sing. And there was uh, huh. four part harmonies or like, you know, different call and response things. Right. And every single time that we get shit up a, a, in front, <laughs> after the set, they are always amazed and saying, damn, that was like one of the best shows I've ever seen or I've ever mixed for. And right. like, you know, us, us being like cool, like nice people were like, oh, cool. Thanks. Like, we don't say like, screw you or whatever for like <laughs> not giving right. us respect. So like, we always have that chip on our shoulders. We have to like impress people. It's not just the sound guys, but the audience. We always felt like we had something to prove. Right. And for me, like I always love, it doesn't matter if I'm headlining or supporting, I'll always play like amazing like i'll try to play amazing right hmm. you know yeah. i'll do gotcha. my best doesn't matter one one person a thousand people i don't care five thousand <laughs> people i don't care i'm always going to play my best that's great yeah that's a good attitude to have and something a uh, a musician shared with me back when i was doing music that of just when you're playing crummy little tiny shows where there's eight people in the room and it feels super awkward uh my friend Matt Jones, he said, you know, it's it's not their fault, the audience's fault that no one else is there. So you should still play to them as if it's a thousand people and just, you know, give them like the best show possible because you can always make an influence or have an impact. Uh, and I just, because yeah. it because I, I would go into shows super discouraged and be like, oh, shit, nobody's here. Uh, I'm, this is going to be a throwaway set. Anyway, sorry, that was a tangent. But I just, <laughs> no, that's, I think that's, that's a good, I like that. I really like that. It's not their fault that no one else is there. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. So what was, and sorry if this has been documented elsewhere, but so Run River North's, at least your last show with them was only like a week and a half ago. Yep. Is that right? Really recent. And so what was your uh, reason for stepping out of the band? Um, I've explained it before. I don't want to get too into it for sure. this this um, this interview, this podcast. but Yeah, totally. Um, I think the short answer is I couldn't find, I was not able to step into the creative space 
um, when we were when the band was writing new songs, or sure. I didn't want to, for personal reasons. Sure. So okay. basically, uh, I think we're we're pretty cool. Like the band, you know they they mentioned that you know they they felt betrayed and hurt that I'm leaving them, but they all understand and they all kind of support me and I support yeah. them in everything they do. So we kind of left on a good note. It's going to take a while for us to like hang out again, I think. Yeah. Sure. But after, you know, the the healing is done, I think it will be good again, but it'll take some time because yeah. right now it's so fresh for everyone. Yeah. The ba- the band is still trying to figure things out and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And right. so, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting times, but yeah, I think we're, yeah. we're cool. There's, there's peace and yeah. that's the most I could ask for. Right. Yeah. That's great. And so Did now you? are you, are you going to try to make the production thing like into a yeah, career so, or is it, or yeah, is it already? So I've, I've been in bands since like 2000 uh nine ish so or 2007 basically when i started college around 2006 2007 is when i was in different bands and i haven't not been in a band until now (laughs) and so it feels really weird and i do want to try to shift gears for a second and try the producing thing because you know i was always recording demos and and stuff like that with for our bands and they all sounded amazing Mm -hmm. and i i really love capturing good performances and so i want to try to do that and last year or two years ago when i started collecting analog gear like and tape machines that's when i like really started like oh maybe i could go for this angle instead of just using pro tools and doing things in the box Right. Take things outside. So, yeah. Right now, I'm I'm kind of practicing mixing and trying different techniques before I head out into the world <laughs> again. People know. Some people know that I I produce and and record and, but I do want to be at a better level. Yeah. Than I am right now. So I. It's all about preparation. Even with drumming, like for me, I had to prepare so much. I had to practice a lot to get to where I am, Mm -hmm. to feel confident that I could do the job. And so I want to be at that same level when it comes to producing and mixing. People say like, oh, John, just fake it till you make it. But for me, I'm (laughs) I'm not really that type of person. Maybe it's because like I wear my emotions on my sleeve or like people could read me well. And... Maybe I just want to give myself less stress, but yeah, yeah. I don't really want to fake it till I make it. I just, <laughs> I want to be, I want to be, I want to know where I'm at. I want people to know where I'm at when, I, yeah. when working together. Right. So, so, so how do you know when you've made it though? How do you know when you got the level where you're like, okay, I can do this now? Um, when my mixes sound good. <laughs> just to, to my you. ears. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I could figure out like different problems that I have and if I know how to solve it. And I've been, you know, sending it out to friends that I trust and they've been very supportive or not supportive, but very encouraging. They said a lot of good things. I think my mixes sound way better now than it has in the past. And that's mm-hmm. just because of the change of workflow. Gotcha. Wait, so and I'm already. Mm-hmm, go ahead. It, no, if you, if you could indulge me for a second as as I'm sort of trying to do something not some something similar not quite as intense but so like what are some specific things that you're like oh here's something cool that i've figured out in a mix situation that i don't know is there anything more technical you could explain there that you're like learning right now that'd be fun um yeah if you if we want to go into technicalities of it i think for me in the past i i've realized not with okay so i have a console right now an old Mm -hmm. Tascam m520 it's like you know not not the greatest, but I how many channels cool is that? It's a twenty channel okay, mixer cool. with eight buses and gotcha. four aux channels. So I would do sixteen channels and have the last four of the twenty as my aux channels or aux gotcha. sends or aux receives. Anyways, um, the biggest thing that I've learned switching to analog 
and to the mixing console is the faders. You know how people mm-hmm. say like, oh, automation and all of that. But for me, right. I think actually performing with the dynamics and the musician or the guitar part or vocal part with the faders going up when I want it a little bit louder or going down. Right. Just like feeling the music. I think that's where like each producer slash mixer could set themselves apart based on how they automate or quote unquote ride the fader. And so I've been learning a lot about that and it's been really fun. So I think I, I kind of want to try to get into live uh, mixing front of house, you know, live shows mm-hmm. just, just for yeah, yeah. the rider experience, just to do riders. I don't care about like compression and EQ <laughs> too much that I could do at home. But like, I think in a live setting, you're kind of forced to really be instinctive with, uh, is that a word instinctive? Yeah. Instinct- yeah, yeah, yeah. Instinctual. Right. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> to, to ride. We'll see. That's just an idea. So that's the yeah. biggest takeaway from uh, rec- mixing with the console. Right. Yeah. Wait, and so this is maybe a dumb question. I'm just thinking of how that works practically. So you've got all the tracks on your 16 things and do you just kind of like, you start, you hit play at the beginning and it's being recorded into Pro Tools and like a stereo file and you're doing the real time like automation, the the faders. Is that how it works or is it something more complicated yeah. than that? I just no, never done that, anything on a console. Yeah. Yeah, that that's how that's exactly how it works. I mean, okay. technically, back in the back in the day, there was a, another tape machine, stereo tape machine, uh, usually half inch, two track, gotcha. and they would just mix it down to that and send that off to the mastering place. But for for now, um, with Pro Tools, you could do a lot of things. You could actually print individual tracks as direct outs, right? So let's say because the the downside with analog mixing is recall recallability i, I can't yes. do recalls if i do a stereo mix <laughs> yeah someone comes but, back says i want those guitars up 3 db and you're like well uh okay give me half a day and i'll go do exactly that <laughs> exactly so i'm thinking for myself i'm going to if i'm not doing completely analog i would go direct out from my console and print tracks back into pro tools um with all the the faders and you know all the automation happening Mm -hmm. i would have i would have to pan like in pro tools because since i'm just sending a mono out i won't be able to pan stereo but whatever i could do that in pro tools panning is easy and then if they wanted let's say a guitar part up at a certain section i'll just do that in in the box at that point i see yeah yeah just for the ability to react quickly to someone's notes i guess you'd have to change it up a little bit that makes sense exactly so, so it, it a, depends on the project and depends what I want to do. So gotcha. a quick aside, in in the year 2017, where do you actually buy analog tape <laughs> and is it expensive? It's damn expensive. I, um, figured, I have yeah. a half inch, 10 inch reel and it cost me about $90. And wow, that'll okay. give me about, maybe with this one... I think anywhere between 16 to 32 minutes. Wow. Okay. But Good you could always sense. like record over them. Sure. So unless you're just doing analog, like Death Cab for Cuties, uh, Narrow Stairs album, which they did all analog from beginning to end, all the way to mastering. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. I y- y- You only need one tape unless you're going to do, or like Foo Fighters, you know, Foo Fighters, have, they were known to do like tape all the way through and through. Okay. <laughs> Radiohead as well. They have a lot of masters done on tape. Yeah. Huh. Gosh, yeah, so. that is fascinating. <laughs> it's sort of analogous to shooting on uh, shooting a movie on film because you know film print is fantastically expensive, and then getting it, yep. um, getting it. Uh, what am I trying to say? Not exposed, but uh, developed. Rendered. Developed. Thank you. Oh my gosh, <laughs> forgot the simplest word. Yeah, developed. Anyway. Yeah. I actually shoot um, film photography as well. Oh, right on. But that was only because that's what I learned on back in high school. And I never really bought a digital camera. And when Instagram came back, I realized, hey, let me 
pick up my camera again and I started shooting a lot and I bought a bunch of cameras, but film, yeah, to me, once again, it's not about the aesthetic, even though the aesthetic is nice. <laughs> and I feel That's like true. I'm cheating because people have to work for that film look. For me, I just shoot, develop at home and I scan it and it's already right there. I just right, adjust yeah. like, I just need to adjust maybe brightness and contrast, but it's all there. I don't have to do much. It's, <laughs> sure. It's just a workflow that I kind of, like grew up with and that's what i know so right yeah. <laughs> that that absolutely appeals to me i mean i'm i would i would not call myself a filmmaker but i shot my first film last october and just talking with my dp who knows uh, i mean we shot digital we we didn't have the yeah. budget to shoot a movie on, on film but but he was just talking about how i mean the digital sensors and cameras are getting better all the time and that they're like you said, able to mimic the look of film, but he said something about the blacks, specifically the black colors, where a digital camera, something will get so dark that it will just kind of drop off. It doesn't have enough information to keep mm -hmm. processing. But with, with with film, it just rolls off, was the term he used, that the grain is able to get so low on an f-stop. I think I'm using the right terms here, but um, anyway, and, and that's, that just gives it like this tiny little bit of, of richness and clarity and the contrast is, is noticeably, uh, more present. So anyway, I know, I know people get nitpicky and they're like, film is the only way or, or vinyl is the only way. And I'm, I'm not really one of those people, but I can appreciate the tiny nuances of, of analog versus digital. Yeah. What, uh, what film did you do? <laughs> um, it's a little, so it's not done yet. I'm still editing it. Um, okay, cool. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's called cordial kill. It's a little, uh, short film that I wrote and directed. Uh, it's like a, it's like an homage to Quentin Tarantino and Martin Scorsese. Um, yeah, 1980s era crime film. So oh, and it's okay. just about done and I'm trying to get it finished for, to start submitting the festivals in April or May. So we're really close to done, in fact, like yeah. as of today. So, um, yeah, it's exciting. And then it'll go get uh, mixed, the sound mixed, and it'll be color balanced and all that. So, yeah, anyway. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep my eye out for that. Right on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll send you a link when it's out. Andy did the music. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so it's perfect. just a little little family uh, project here. Mm -hmm. Ink and Echo. Nice. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. I, you you mentioned minimalism earlier. Does that play out in the rest of your life? You, you know, I I'm not. Hold on, I think I got disconnected. Oh, we're back on. Um, so minimalism in my life, I try to keep things simple. I'm not extreme as to like how certain people are. Like, there's a lot of minimalist blogs that I kind of read now and then. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. and they kind of go extreme to the point where it's like even furniture wise and gear wise, I'm definitely like, if you look at my, my studio bedroom studio, like it's definitely not minimalist, but, <laughs> mm. yeah. um, I do like to purge my closet, um, quite often. And I definitely go for a black and white outfit. I, I, it's simpler for me when it comes to yeah. cars. I, I keep it simple, <laughs> manual transmission and simple setup, no Bluetooth in my car. Mm, yeah. When it comes to phones, I have a Blackberry and it keeps things minimal. I don't have a lot of apps. So I think Blackberry, yeah, me, wow. Blackberry. I haven't seen Blackberry. someone with a Blackberry in a long time. Blackberry <laughs> Passport, baby. It's called the Blackberry Passport. <laughs> It's a beautiful phone, man. I, I love it. The keyboard is amazing. Um, it limits me from not accessing a lot of different apps. But yeah, that's that's kind of like what I try to live for. I keep only what I can use. And when I go backpacking too, I I guess I'm an ultralight backpacker where I try to just keep only the ne necessities and see if I could use an item more than just one way. So multi-purpose. So I gotcha. like to try to find things that are multi-purpose in my life. Yeah. Gotcha. Wait, so so given all of that, now I'm curious. Well, because, I mean, we've talked on this show before, Josh and I, about um, our smartphones and social media and stuff. And we actually have locks on our phones. So our wives have the 
passcode and we can't install any apps unless we give it to them <laughs> to, to be able Amazing. to do it. Yeah. So, um, so I'm with, I'm totally with you there, but is, so given what you just said, do you have any thoughts about social media or our general internet culture these, these a days? <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, I'm actually, you know, I, I said I have a Blackberry. I was actually looking at a couple of, um, dumb phones, mm. specifically the, <laughs> the sexiest dumb phone that I've seen was the punked MP01, but that's just way too damn expensive. It's $300 <laughs> for a phone that shouldn't for, be $300. For but just it. a it's, phone? It's a phone. You could text. It has a calendar. I think, I don't know if you could like put in events. It just has a calendar. And then I think an alarm and address book address book. Oh man. So like all these other f like minimal phones out there is just like a phone. But like, I think with this MP01, you could like text, which is, I think all that I really need calling in text, but yeah, right. I am. I'm with you, man. I had to, even on my Blackberry, I, I do have like made the major social media stuff like Twitter and Instagram, mm -hmm. no Snapchat, no Facebook. I'm off Facebook. Like I got rid of that years ago. Good man. Um, yeah. It's, it's changed my life. So with my phone, I actually put Instagram and Twitter into a different folder where I can't just like mindlessly click on it. Yeah, it's not just and one click away anymore. Exactly. Yeah. To actually access this, I have to type in Instagram or type in Twitter to do it. And that takes a lot of effort. And I realized... You have to pull up Terminal, do a search. No, actually yeah. with, Black, with BlackBerry, you just need to type. <laughs> and it's there. So, but it's actually helped me not waste my time because you're right. Yeah. This, our smartphones is, smartphones are making us not like dumb, but like disconnected. All of the things, like we've read it yeah, for yeah. so many years. I feel like there mm -hmm. should be a term for, for this, I guess, complaining <laughs> about smartphone things. Yeah. <laughs> everyone knows. I think everyone knows it. Everyone says the same thing. But, and yet we're all still here doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess it gets kind of old, but I guess it's an individual thing and each per to, to each, you know, their own, basically. Well, yeah, and it seems like you are very cognizant of, like you're very aware of the things that are potentially bad or harmful to you in different ways and are taking actions to limit those things. Whereas I think a lot of people you know, I, I'd include myself in a lot of these things. It's just like, well, here's this new easy thing. Like I can tweet from my phone now and I can like, that's so cool. It's so easy. But then you don't really think about the ramifications of it or what you're taking away from other parts of your life. And I think that could be, <laughs> that's what I wish people had. Like, I don't really care. You can do whatever you want with Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, but like, just be more cognizant of what it's doing or what it's taking away from your life. Mm. That's what I think people are missing. Yeah, because I'm not, I'm not one to get on a soapbox and be like, well, I mean, we kind of did on this show, but whatever. <laughs> but I, do, I don't good. necessarily, I don't necessarily want to be just like, hey guys, Twitter is bad. You should not be on Twitter. Like, I don't want to be that guy or something, or you shouldn't have an iPhone or whatever. Just like figure out how to make it work for you. Make it not exactly. a terrible thing in your life. Yeah, I think a, a good advice that someone told me and I've done from the beginning of social media was to turn off notifications. Yes. Yeah. And just only go on it when you have free time and then respond to those like DMs or comments like when you get when you have the time. You don't have to do it right away. If they really wanted to reach out to you, then they would have your number and text you or call you. But so right. but at that point then you're like friends, so that's okay. But Yeah. And yeah. I'll I'll say personally not having a voicemail set up has been amazing. I hate voicemail so much. <laughs> wow. Yeah, people still so, people still call you, huh? They Nobody do. Nobody calls me anymore. They just text me. <laughs> yeah, that w I wish that, that would be the case, but <laughs> and it's like if you really need to get a hold of me, you can try a little harder, and we'll figure it out. But don't leave me a voicemail, please. So <laughs> interesting. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not there yet. I, I no one leaves voicemails for me anymore. So well, it sounds I like you're I, I, you're there I by default you. then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you so, go. Uh, John, you seem like. From the from my thirty minute perception of you, like uh, you know, pretty grounded, like mature, thoughtful person. How does a personality like yours, who you know appreciates art and you know seem like a deep thinker, live in the midst of Los Angeles, where 
uh, at least the culture at large is, um, you know, p- perhaps a bit surfacey and, uh, plasticky and fake. I'm sure there are exceptions, but just what, what is your perception of the, the culture in Los Angeles? So what I love about Los Angeles, I grew up in Los Angeles, so yeah. I don't have, I, I do see like a lot of aspects of what people are saying, but mm-hmm. I grew up in a place where LA is my home. I've seen grit. I've seen streets. I've seen, um, poor, rich people. I've seen, happy people, sad people. I've seen ugly people, beautiful people, you know, I've seen it all. And to me, like when I think of LA, I think of the people that kind the natives, the local people that kind of grew up here Mm -hmm. and had to really struggle and hustle to make things work while, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying transplants or people that are from other cities and stuff I'm not saying they're not hustling and struggling, Sure. But I think growing up and seeing that around me a lot has made me appreciate LA a little bit more because there are people who do make it and they're, they're doing well when, you know, when people talk about the superficiality of LA and, and stuff like that, I think that's just like a small pocket. And that Mm, pocket is also known as West Hollywood. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So I just kind of avoid that area. I live in Glendale, which is closer to like downtown LA, um, Eagle Rock, Silver Lake, kind of where all the more, I guess you could say trendy people are. But I Uh I grew up in Glendale and Glendale is home to a lot of diverse um, people. We have a lot of Armenians, Hispanics, Asians, white people, not a lot of black people. Actually, there are some, but (laughs) <laughs> but it's pretty, yeah. pretty diverse. And, and I love that. I love seeing different aspects of things. And if people, you know, people who grew up in like, or people who live in the, the Silver Lake Echo Park areas of LA, I think they also see that too, because back in the day, those, those places were not affluent and not that mm-hmm. it's, it is now. I mean, it's coming up because of gentrification, but like they still see remnants of, old LA in those areas. And so they could kind of witness um, a different side of LA that is not superficial, that is not all about looks and lifestyle. I think Instagram, I think social media, once again, going back to the social media thing, like it shows that like it tries to sell that, it tries to sell LA in a light where, hey, come out here to, to live a certain lifestyle to right. be pretty, to to be rich and to to have fun, to party all night, to to be famous pretty much and and have mm-hmm. people like you. Um I think yeah, social media it, it's just highlights certain aspects and it's very curated curated um to make a person seem like a different <laughs> thing, a different person, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know, that's social Certainly. media thing. Yes. So, right. yeah, I could see why people outside of L.A. thinks that L.A. is very superficial. But if you've lived here long enough, I think people start to realize, especially if you live outside of West Hollywood, yeah, you tend to realize that it's not like that. And right. I'm just like generalizing West Hollywood. I have friends who live out in West Hollywood and <laughs> they're awesome. They're not superficial. But yeah. technically, a lot of people who come here and they, they want to try to be actors or writers, they, they tend to live in, in that area. And that's where a lot of the um, stereotypes are seen. Gotcha. Right. Okay. I'm just that's, curious, sp- yeah. speaking of LA, um, like, you know, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Josh is in Denver. Um, how, in terms of opportunities to do music and producing all this stuff, how important do you see being in LA? Like, I know all the stuff you just said about how great it is, but you know, how, how important is it to be physically there to do the things that you are wanting to do? That's, that's interesting. My friend, Kyle Moore, who was, hey, an, I know him. I think I went up, to college yeah. with him. Yep. There you go. <laughs> um, he, he came out here to, you know, find 
opportunities and there there is opportunity there are opportunities here because the music industry is out here or part of the music industry is out here the other parts yeah. are in Nashville and New York right but because people are working here like the industry like industry people are working here there's a better chance for you to actually go set up meetings go to for them to go out to shows to see where you're at so a lot of people you know go to certain venues to find different acts you know there's still people out there hustling a and r's people who hustle a and r's who are, are just getting into the game they would go out there to to find a special person a, an artist right or whatever a, a producer writer my friends just moved to two of my friends just moved to nashville to get closer to the the whole songwriting mecca mm -hmm. of, of it all and try to try to do it there because la has become a place where they kind of didn't feel like they belonged anymore um mm -hmm. So for for the same reason, you just want to be closer to people who are doing it. I know there there is quite a music scene out in Al Albuquerque, but it's definitely a lot smaller sure. well, than yeah. L.A. And to surround yourself with other like-minded people, it just kind of inspires you. But right. it's definitely harder to make it. I think if you are a already established band or a songwriter or composer or producer you could kind of go anywhere and do it right i always hear of like my favorite bands they're all not really from la i don't know <laughs> any of my favorite bands that are from la actually cold war kids is, are, and thrice are probably the only bands that i know right that i still follow that are from la or socal but most other most other bands are from you know random places like Omaha, <laughs> or you know stuff like that. So it's it's kind of weird. Like you don't necessarily have to be here, but I right. think it's harder. And as with my old band, our label was out here. So we when we had to go talk to them, we would just go to their office. Or if right. we had to go meet up for like music videos, it would just be right there. We don't have to fly out and make it a whole big deal. We just drive. Right. Yeah. Would, would you say, because I'm in sort of a weird position where I'm, you know, I'm doing music for a living from Albuquerque, which is great. And I love it here. And I don't want to move, but I do realize like, well, there, there are probably opportunities I could have if I was in a certain area. But then there's another part of me that's like, well, I've got enough on my plate without all that. Like, why would I want to just go and be in a bigger pool of people and potentially have to be more competitive and have be way more busy or something so for me i'm just like i'm i'm pretty content at least location wise <laughs> like things are going fine i don't want it to be more crazy and i just wonder if like i mean because all my stuff came from youtube and being on the internet i just wonder if places like la if the allure will go away because people are like well i don't i don't have to do that i could just make a youtube channel or i can just do this or that and i don't you don't have to go anywhere um, I think it depends on the type of person you are. If you yeah. if you grind and hustle, and if you don't let um, the price of living in LA jade <laughs> you down, or you know get you jaded, then yeah, you could survive and and do well in LA. Um, for me, it's it's funny that you, you're mentioning that you might want to move out to LA or whatever. For oh, me, I said I don't. I want, <laughs> oh, yeah. Or, or whoever wants to. Like for me, right. like, I kind of want to start over in a different city. That's like uh -huh. a possibility in my mind. Just because I, I want to eventually build a studio. And yeah. doing that in LA, if you don't have money, it's kind of impossible. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah totally. We'll see. That's pretty cool. So what's the, what's the role of drums for you now? now that you're not in the band yeah um it's kind of weird i was just talking to my friend about it and i've i haven't played drums in a couple of weeks i like to see, i have a set um i have a kit set up in my in my room the same room as where my studio stuff is so it's uh -huh. a very cramped space but whenever i have a chance i would just get on it and just play a little bit but yeah in terms of drums i think it's starting to take a back seat hmm. and that kind of like made a couple of my friends sad but <laughs> if an opportunity comes for me to go on tour i would definitely pick up my sticks again you know what i mean right just to just to make some money and 
for the for the goal of me trying to um, be a producer to build a studio, not build a studio, but like collect gear where people want to say, hey, that guy has unique taste in, in gear. I want to go record with that guy. So that's like my goal for the next maybe two, three, four, five years. Yeah. If producing doesn't work out, then I don't know. I'll just move to Scandinavia <laughs> or something. We'll see. Do you, this is all making me think, and I just thought, of, well, I just thought of this now. Do you know who Will Yip is? He, he, he Yips? Sounds, no, my I man, don't actually. My man, the Yips over there, Will <laughs> Yips. <laughs> well, I think he, he's basically done what you are saying you want to do. He's like, I think I he was no the drummer for like alicia keys or something or some something crazy like that and he nice. now he's he's not a drummer he's like a producer in philadelphia and he does all um circus survive and anthony green stuff um Dude. and all all these so it's just it's just interesting because it seems like he had the exact same trajectory of you he's like a big drummer and then uh now he's just a producer and has a studio in philadelphia so there you go philadelphia <laughs> i wouldn't yeah. mind going to philadelphia yeah mm. i've been there once and i really liked it yeah, it's an awesome city. Um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll look him up because I definitely need to see other people who's done what I what I want to do to yeah. just kind of push me. Sure, I know a lot of a lot of producers were once drummers. I, I think there's a a good connection to that. I think drummers do have a certain perspective that, let's say, a, a, a guitar player has or doesn't have. So right. Um, it's kind of encouraging for me. Yeah, and to be able, it seems like, and maybe this is wrong, I mean, this is coming from me as a guitar player and a non-drummer, it seems like in a producing sense, it, it's even if you have no knowledge of any instruments, it's easier to speak to a guitar or bass player about what they're doing and not a drummer. <laughs> like You've got to have a certain amount of knowledge to be able to like, well, you need to hit the snare more like this instead, or, or, you know, it seems like it's a little bit more specialized and more useful in a production sense to know more about drums, unless I I'm wrong. So. I don't know. No, you might be right. I think there's also the aspect of when I'm playing drums, I don't really, sometimes I don't have to think about the chord structures. Right. I mean, as a drummer, I, I you don't really have to, but for me, I like to. But sometimes yeah. when I don't, I'm just playing a monotonous like groove. I like mm -hmm. to listen to, especially the bass player. Like for yeah. me, bass is everything. Like if I didn't play drums, I would play bass. Nice. But as a drummer, I'm listening to everything. And I think that's the practice that I've, I've gained over playing, you know, like 16 years that I've gained a knowledge of like how things fit yes. in a band setting or in a musical setting. So I, I've learned to really kind of push music. And when I create with bands or when I create music, it's, I'm usually the last person to talk about lyrics. I, I could right. care less about lyrics or that's just like my lowest on the priorities of things to think yes. about. For me, it's about how does, how do certain things fit within this very small space for me, like the recording format, like even though like it's, there's a wide range for me, it's not that wide of a range and you have to find space for each voice. Right. And, I, I believe that not every voice can be heard all at the same time. Someone was saying like you could only listen to three things at once and focus on three things in, mm. a, in a song. Um, so mm. you got to find ways to, hey, let's make the guitar player do this at this, this point in the song when the vocalist isn't singing. Or if the singer is singing very boring parts, let's have something else fill underneath to make it right. exciting. So stuff, stuff like that, like that's my favorite part of writing is to try to figure out how we can make each point interesting without it being just a singer. Right. Yeah. And I think I have that similar perspective and a lot of it is because my mom is an artist. And so growing up, I, I remember specifically there was this contest I entered to draw a picture for some, it's a relatively big thing. And I started by drawing this tiny little uh, astronaut in the middle of this big paper. And she was like, no, what are you doing? Like, there's so much white space you're leaving out. Like, make it way bigger and fill in with all these. She was, because she's all about color and using the space, right? So ever since that, I've just, ha it, it, it translated to music the sense like, okay, there's like space. So you want to fill it up, but you don't want to like have stuff overlapping. Like you want to, you want it to be a big, bright, colorful beautiful thing but you can't leave all the white space but you can't fill it in too much either so i've always seen it in like a very visual color 
based sense and i so it sounds like the exact same thing you're talking about Ex- I really exactly like um going off what you're saying like in terms of like art um i'm going to push it to tv or i guess netflix yeah. now but Bo- bojack horseman was the most recent tv series that i've watched where it kind of does that well like if you're yeah. watching it like i think bojack horseman is a show that you kind of have to uh, attentively watch and not yes. just leave in the background because there's just so many like visual things that are going on that just uh-huh. add to it because there's like a lot of transition <laughs> scenes. I don't know what you call that B roll or whatever transition scenes. Sure. Yeah. And, and you see like a little detail that's just like, Oh, that's funny. Yeah. There's like a little jab or like a little inside joke. Well, and they're really just taking advantage fun. of the fact like that they're all animals that are people. And so there's these exactly. weird random yeah. things that'll happen like that a certain animal will do. It just kind of catches you. Yeah, I love that show. Yeah. I think that's yeah. so great. <laughs> so that's that's a that's another like great analogy of trying to fill space and to make things interesting all, right. all the time. Yeah. And as and a like, filmmaker, I feel like that's a challenge, but it's it's a dope challenge that I think oh, people yeah. should do more often. Oh yeah, and then when all the pieces f- fall into place, that's like one of the most satisfying things. Which I'm sure, are you feeling that way, Josh, about editing your movie? Do you feel like it's falling into place and like, oh, this is great, everything is just the right amount of time and and all that stuff. Uh, I mean, it's nice to feel it finally coming together, but unfortunately, in the editing process, I I'm seeing all the little things I wish I did <laughs> differently. But but granted, this is only my first one, and so I'll I'll grow in skill, hopefully. But sure, because um, I mean, I as you know, Andy, but just in general, I aspire to guys like Paul Thomas Anderson and Stanley Kubrick, who yeah. both of them are very intentional about not only the space but the. Um, almost like the geometry of their shots. They hmm. often shoot very, ge- uh, not geometrically, what is the, uh, so everything's symmetrical. So oh, like everything is balanced to your eye and they leave things sit for a long time. And, um, you know, they do these wide open shots with lots of detail, but everything almost feels like it's been, you know, placed there specifically by a, you know, hand painted almost. Right. Uh, so anyway, I know that wasn't your question, but it's like, I'd, I'd love to get to a point where I have that sensibility and where I have the eye to place camera positions in that way and also build build sets that, you know, just there's so much to soak in even when you're sitting still, when the camera's sitting still. Well, and I'm still constantly amazed, like thinking about music, you're just, you're purely talking audio, but when you're talking about a movie or a show, like you're taking every, basically every form yeah. of art and trying to do that similar process, like with the writing, the framing, the audio, like you've got to do that with all of those things. And that sounds insane to me. I don't understand it at all. I can do like one. I'll, I'll do the audio. <laughs> that's what, that's yeah. why there are so many different jobs on a movie for right. different people to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's something I can't get into as well. I, I don't know how people do it. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, you're crazy. You're amazing. Well, it, it may not it may not translate too well, so we'll see. <laughs> so, John, I have a question that's kind of on a different track, and this this may be broad or general or hard for me to articulate. But um, I I get a sense in our culture lately that uh, creative people around our age, and the social media stuff kind of ties into this. But just what is your general both approach to when you sit down to create? paired with your overall, um, I guess, contentment or satisfaction in life, because lately there just seems to be an attitude of, or, or this, this belief that seeps into your head of just, I'm not, I'm not valuable as a person unless I'm making something or unless I'm productive or putting something out and I have a following and blah, blah, blah. Like people's self-worth is so tied into that lately. And I, I, so anyway, what does that make you think about? Feel free to say whatever. (laughs) No, that's a very good question. And I think I could see it as where is not, um, where, let me think, how do I phrase this? Like, I think the question to me, it seems like you're asking is, do you create art just for the sake of creating or do you create art for likes and hearts and mm-hmm. and followers and that's that's how i'm translating your 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 question and sure. i think that's a question that like every artist or creative person 
has to go through. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's funny because like I, I have a friend who started taking beautiful landscape photos, and I think he got a addicted not addicted but he likes the fact that he's taking amazing photos but also at the same time he's posting him on his instagram and um people are loving it you know and i think that's pushing him to go to like he wanted to go to grand canyon this week this weekend like out of nowhere and just just to go shoot and i was like oh you're doing it for the gram huh you're doing it for the gram (laughs) I was like, oh, yeah, or not really. He didn't say yeah, but like he was just laughing. But I I don't think that is necessarily a bad thing because if it pushes you to um, create and actually get out to Grand Canyon, I say why not? But sure, sure. I think it's a double-edged sword, like you're saying, because there could come a point where that work or your work could become stale and your likes are not going to be your your likes are going to be plateaued. Your followers, you might lose some because it, you've become stale. And then you start worrying about, oh, how am I going to uh, perform for this audience that I have, rather than how am I going to per- just wh- how come I am not creating just for myself? You know, yeah. Like I think for me personally, I love creating, and I don't necessarily need to have followers although followers equals i think money eventually (laughs) indirectly yeah and if i if i want to keep doing this you got to kind of not compromise but find a balance once again limitations you're 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 put as a musician i think sometimes you want to go out of the verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus chorus structure (laughs) yeah it's like but how can you be creative within that structure because that structure is going to sell your records possibly Mm. and so right always finding creative, like always finding something creative to do within those limitations is once again, yeah, those are your limitations again. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's where I find the most content. But once again, my, my brother, not once again, my brother is an artist and he, he does things, you know, just for himself creatively, uh, or he wants to, you know, make it as an artist, but he finds joy in just creating and some people are like that. Some people are not. Some people need the reinforcement by followers or whatever to to do better. And so it depends on the person you are. And that comes down to your artistic integrity. And you got to kind of ask yourself the question, hey, am I doing this for followers or am I doing this for myself? What do I like about this that I can do this for myself versus how much can I push myself to not compromise my artistic integrity for others? But I'm yeah. curious if you guys, if both of you would agree or disagree to this, um, just that this whole conversation we're having right now has become more and more prevalent than it used to be, just because, just purely because of technological things. Because I think, I mean, and maybe this is totally wrong, but like, you know, 50, 60 years ago in the music industry, I don't think a kid who picked up the guitar or, or drums or whatever had that thought in their head nearly as much as we did because it's not like you know you could be playing guitar for a week and then post yourself playing smells like teen spirit on instagram and get some likes and be like oh that feels really good but i would say that i personally would argue that that's not a great way to start off your creative career and someone 60 years ago couldn't even start that way it seemed like it was more more pure and maybe this is overly nostalgic or something but it seems like there was more of a purity back then which also has the problems that there were more gatekeepers back then so it's like yeah. you know one or the other so i don't it's just more we have to walk more of a balance i think than anyone ever has before i agree I, with you i don't think it's a good way to start um i think you yeah once again it's all about balance and you mm-hmm. got to find your focus and figure out the path that you need to take to not or you got to realize the path you are on and yeah. see if that path is going to take you to the right place. For me, when YouTube came up, I had a, I had a bunch of friends who were doing the whole YouTube thing and monetized off YouTube, um, mm-hmm. mostly doing covers and stuff. But yeah, like I think some of them see now, like it didn't really project their career to be like an artist 
Yeah. In a, in, yeah. In, a, in a sense, like a traditional artist, they're, they're still artists, but right. it's like a different form of art, artistry. And I think for me personally, just seeing the path, they, I think there might be a glass ceiling hmm. and to, to the whole YouTube thing, because yeah, they spend a lot of time on covers and they make money. They make a lot of money. I think they make more money than I do. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's it's a great way to do it. So it really depends on what you want as yeah. an artist. It, do you want to make money um, doing the uh, staying home and doing doing it on social media, not just YouTube? You could do it on Instagram and whatever. Or do you want to do the traditional? Um, artist thing like you know getting signed and whatever making money that or try to make money that way because <laughs> right. um, yeah so going back to your thing like you have to I think people need to realize or try to see what path am I on and is this going to take me to where I want to go right and I think and, the important thing kind of like what we mentioned before is to realize to be self-aware to the point that you're you're seeing past just the Facebook comment or the Instagram like and that good feeling that you guys like, well, what is this? What am I, what sort of path am I putting myself on for trying to go for those things or not? You know what I mean? I think it's, mm -hmm. you just have to, the biggest thing for me is like looking a little bit wider than just that piece of content that did a thing for you potentially right then. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's so deep. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> But well, it's interesting because yeah. you were saying um, that little, I guess, burst of affirmation from the likes. The like, dopamine. I feel like, yeah, the dopamine. I feel like, <laughs> you know, I think because we, we are older and we realize that that is so temporary, I think we've realized that we need to find it in people that we actually care about. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for us, it could be, or for you guys, it's it's your wives, maybe. I'm, I'm single, so I have I have no... <laughs> I have nobody to, I guess, support me in that aspect. So I have friends to do that, other musician sure. friends to support me. Um, to me, they their opinion means the most out of anybody, yes. you know? So yeah, I yeah. think one, if people don't have that, if people are just growing up and are, are in their bedrooms making these videos and don't have anyone else to share it with, then it could be very dangerous. Yes. And I, so. I very much believe too, um, basically exactly what you said. Like I have... I have a handful of people I go to with my music and say, what do you think about this? Give me honest feedback. I will take any criticism from you people. And and that I feel like is I did my due, my due diligence for my art so that when it gets posted wherever released, I'm like, and someone says, hey, this is the worst piece of shit I've ever heard. Or someone says, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm like, I'm sort of tempered on both those ends. I'm like, I kind of, I'm going to let those go a little bit. I'm not, living for those things or being affected by those things as much as I could be purely because I did the work ahead of time and be like, okay, I did what I liked. I reached out to people that I respect and got their advice. And now I don't really need anyone else's advice. I mean, I'll yeah. take, I'll take praise and I'll say thank you because I'm honestly thankful for it. But even when people say, I don't know, people say weird stuff. Like I wish you do uh, something like this album you did two years ago. It's like, well, no, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And that's, I didn't do it for you then. And I, you know, that's, it's just a weird thing about artistry. It's like, I, I did this for myself and now you can have it, but I did yep. it for myself first. So yep. that's how it works. At least that's how I, think I that's, want it to work. I think that's when like any art or creative like product is best when you do it for yourself first. And if people latch yeah. onto it, then it's, it's an amazing feeling like, Hey, some other yeah. people, want to support me by coming out to our shows or watching our films or reading our um, books or whatever. Like it's, it's an incredible feeling. And I feel like that yeah. is the most honest and the most, I guess the most, uh, I, I, it's, it's a special thing. Like money cannot, it, it does not equal to money. I think, I think it's no. a, it's a more like emotional, spiritual, whatever kind of thing that you just kind of have to take for, take it with, you know? Yeah, that just sure. kind of, I I kind of didn't make sense, but I hope you get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's worth way more than money. There you go. Yeah, there. Right. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, John, as we're wrapping up, where can people 
find you on the internet? Where can they be <laughs> want to be found? into your personal life? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I'm currently working on a website trying to figure out what I want to put on there. So I have no website yet, but they could just find me on Instagram. I think I'm going to post a little bit more life of my, of my life a little bit here and there. Cause you know, fans of run river North, they, they reached out and they were very curious as to what I'm going to do next. Friends are curious. So I might start post using Instagram more of like a blog thing rather than a, a photo thing. So yeah, they could yeah. reach me on Instagram at, uh, J O H N dot C H O N G underscore. Underscore. Yeah. Dang. Who took the non underscore name? I don't know. Some other John Chong. What a loser. Jeez. <laughs> the best name. <laughs> well, well, this John, has been this great, awesome, man. man. Yeah, yeah. Really good talk. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We I normally I realize... don't like people we don't know. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Damn. You know, I, I really like doing this. I, I like giving back to in, in, in different ways. I always like yeah. sharing, sharing my experiences, sharing my opinions and yeah. Totally. I appreciate you guys taking me on. Oh, yeah, of course. Totally. Yeah. And best of luck to you with your producing and everything. Hope your Thank tapes you. don't get too much more expensive or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I know I got to stock up or something. I'll have yeah. a closet full. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks, right. man. Thanks, man. Thank you. Well, there he was, the only non-asshole living in LA. I'm just <laughs> kidding. You. That's a joke, of course. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not prejudiced against LA. I'm sure some of our listeners live there, and I'm sure they're fine folks. <laughs> I guess, in fact, I'm buying into the the stereotype, which he very graciously explained. But it's sort totally. of like saying, it's sort of like saying everybody in Boulder is a hippie or a stoner, or that everybody in New York is a is an asshole and a like a right. grumpy. Hey, I'm walking here, kind of <laughs> person. So anyway, that was great. Enjoyed that conversation. Um, I think a lot of that LA stereotype comes from just shows too like as i've been watching uh what shows that i've been watching that show love on netflix okay. i watched it um one of us watched it while we were having diarrhea last night um <laughs> <laughs> gotta and, pass the time somehow so there's that and then i've been watching pete holmes new tv show so it's like oh, yeah. every comedian who's in la makes a tv show that's based in la mm -hmm. and i feel like it just gives it this uh you know snooty not not really intentionally but just like the the myth the mythical la vibe comes out on all those shows which yeah is unfair probably for sure. desert dwellers like us we don't get the full picture sure sure the so. yeah the assumption that every barista and waitress is like trying to be an actress and every right every guy has a script and an invention or something right right so yeah which is <laughs> true so john's one of john's comments made me think that maybe i need to rethink my opinion of bojack horseman because yeah I've only i know i'm so glad watched, you said that I've i told you to watch two it. episodes i know it is funny about dude. those shows it but now does it do you have to kind of give it a bit to really yeah sell, I sell over yeah that's because it phrase <laughs> You're bad with phrases today. I'm um, really bad, yeah. And it, it gets dark if you like dark humor, I, which I do. It's great. Yeah, it's I do. Depression, alcoholism, <laughs> and drugs. <laughs> it's so good, man. Give I'll it a shot. I'll consider it, yeah. Okay. I'll consider it considered. <laughs> great. But yeah, that was a very good interview. I really like him. And yeah. Cool. Well, that's probably all that needs to be said about the matter. I think so. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us. This has been Un Ink and Echo number 32. Until next time. Oh, shit. I do that every time. Here we go. Internet comment. Internet comment. <laughs> Bye, everybody. One, two, three, four, oh, 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 o
The OG on the couch. The OG on the couch. Living like Kevin. Living like Kevin. Ha <laughs> ha